Hello, Mudis here. How are you? Hi, Sai. I'm good. How are you? I'm well. Thank you so much. It's good to be together as always. And we have a wonderful guest again today. But but before we dive in, my good friend, would love for you to tell us a little bit about your background and just briefly introduce the audience to yourself. Absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Mudasir. I am a leadership and transformation coach. I work with teams and leaders to identify the opportunities and challenges in helping them everyone to operate at their best levels. Beautiful. And a quick introduction from your end, Sai. Most definitely. Thank you so much, my friend. Likewise, I focus on transformation and change, and I partner with organizations to really help them calibrate their, their business models and operating models to maximize their impact. As I like to say and, and demonstrate, if you will, I'm, I'm a catalyst and an alchemist who really helps mm -hmm. organizations embrace that sacred triad, as I call it, the reality, their, their human nature, and their own identity to ensure their aliveness through awareness for that impact. And without too much more about us, if you will, Munister, I'm going to say a few words and then introduce our guest into the conversation. Absolutely. Please go ahead. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, so David has a book that came out recently, which we're, we'll dive into, and of course, is the title of the session. Uh, I love the, the quote that we have from him, and this is very, very key, of course. He, he says, be warned, resilience is not for the lazy, ordinary, or faint of heart. And we'll definitely dive into it. He says, the cost of resilience is high, and its challenges, often, uh, oftentimes daunting, if you will. And he says, resilience mm -hmm. can't simply be bought with money or implemented with checklists. It requires, and I love this part, it requires the endless embrace of change along with the will to evolve and hopefully flourish. And he says, these are the realities of resilience. So most definitively, we welcome David into the conversation. Welcome, David. How are you? Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, just fine. Thanks very much. Thanks very Excellent. much. So, hey, David. Pleasure to have you. Thank you. Don't, so wait, much. don't I get to be a wise soul? Like everyone you introduce is like a wise soul and, and thoughtful. And all I get is I wrote a book. That's great. Okay, good. Well, right. We're going to dive into background. Yeah. Like <laughs> everyone man. gets like this glowing introduction of like humanity. And so think about I wrote the a book. Power, think it's about good. the power of the quote. Right? Yeah. The power yeah. of the quote there you is go. truly, truly critical <laughs> to us. But tell us, who is David? No, oh, let's not go there. I'll tell you what, let me give you, I, I've seen the show a couple of times. Let me give you sort of like a, a brief introduction that leads us into, I think, where we want to go for our conversation. Uh, so my background is in <clears throat> political science, psychology, and philosophy. Got the PhD, taught at the university for a while, then went into management consulting, did that for a while. Uh, and then I was in the wrong room at the wrong time. And someone says, hey, uh, how would you like to do a business continuity program for a large organization? And I said, that sounds fine. What is business continuity? And that led me down a multi-year path. Uh, like, well, you know, basically it's making sure that your giant organization can stay afloat no matter what. Oh, well, how hard can that be? Um, so did business continuity for a number of years. Um, that led me to sort of really rethinking the way that we do business continuity. I think we've inherited a lot of practices from before iPhones when, and mainframes and Y2K, and that doesn't really embrace and capture uh, most of the things that your guests talk about here, which is, you know, the, the pace of change and lean uh, and, and uh, motivation and different types of things there. Um, so that led me to uh, do some an in, new industry standard, uh, some new rethinking, published a book there. And then in January of 2020, uh, we had COVID. And all of a sudden, the whole world was interested in what I was interested in, right? It's like everybody, all of a sudden, the whole world is like, what, wait, you watch Walking Dead? I watch Walking Dead. Let's talk about Walking Dead. Oh, that sounds fun. Let's write about it. I mean, everyone was just writing about for, for months and months and months. Like, what does this mean? And what are we going to do? And how bad will it be? You know, it's funny looking back at that time you sort of have a clear picture of, oh, well, I know what we needed to do, right? We needed to work from home. We needed to uh, uh, do things remotely. We needed, and, and things will be all right. We'll need to shift a little bit. But we didn't know that at the time. I think we, we forget that so easily. Uh, it was so complex and so chaotic. And how bad will it be? And how many deaths will we have? And what can we do? And those types of things. 
So I really then started looking at, and I, I followed every as much news as I could every day to say, okay, well, what are people doing? What are organizations doing? How are we all going to get through this? Um, and it's very interesting. So two years later, um, some organizations have died. Some organizations, most organizations have survived. Um, some even flourished. So what are those differences? And I will tell you, uh, going in, before starting the research, I, I was very wrong about my thoughts of what was really going to drive those things. Um, and we can talk about that as well. But I think when we talk about resilience, we typically have uh, sort of two uh, images in mind. One comes from individual resilience. And I know you've talked about this on your show as well uh, with Kristen Ulmer and, and some mm -hmm. other folks. Um, but, you know, individual resilience brings up a lot of, you know, grit and stick to itness and keep on going. And it turns out that's totally wrong uh, for what organizations need to do. And we can talk mm -hmm. about that in a little bit. And the other is um, I had all these what I now call uh, robust ideas. Oh, well, resilience is simply a combination of risk management and insurance and crisis management and business continuity and cybersecurity. And, and if you put enough of those things in the organization, everything's going to be fine. Well, that's, that's just wrong too. Um, all of those things typically just reinforce the status quo. And if the status quo was working, you wouldn't need resilience because it would just take care of itself. Um, so now we get to change and, and some other ideas. So, so, uh, so excellent, excellent start. So if we claim wrong, then what is right? <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, it's very interesting. I, I came up with 14 factors, themes, elements that came up time and time again in the research, the case studies, uh, uh, the anecdotes, all the things, the, the narratives, which, of course, are just as important as, you know, the, the factual case studies as well, right? Um, this is not, you know, the 14 items, they don't spell something clever. Uh, they don't make an acronym that's neat. Uh, I can't make a nice diagram of them, right? It's just these things that came up time and time again. Uh, and we can go through some of the, the top level things. Um, but each one of them was a bit surprising. The f one we can talk about is just sort of capital, right, in general. Um, and, you know, and I start with capital usually because people, when I start explaining, like, yeah, okay, that makes sense, right? Hey, if you're a big organization and you have a, more money to throw at the problem, you probably have more options and you're probably going to be better off. Uh, most of the businesses that failed uh, are particularly small mom and pops, right? You think of the restaurants, the local this and the local that, right? Well, part of that reason is, is cash. Um, but what's really interesting, though, is, of course, capital is not only cash, but also relationships. So, I mean, Sai, you talk about the human component quite a lot. Uh, and so the relationships that we have and, and, and trust uh, and, and being able to rely on that trust and then things like uh, information, uh, I mean, wow, the people that could pull more information, meaningful information from different places to really inform their decisions. But let's go back to cash for a minute. One of the things that became clear is, um, first of all, the most successful, the most, the companies, organizations that flourished were ones that were able, that outspent. So typically we think, oh, crud, something bad is happening. Let's tighten the belt. Let's skip spending. Let's pull in and pull in and pull in. Well, that's not a good strategy. Of course, just throwing a lot of money randomly at the pro problem isn't a good strategy either, right? So it's that really careful balance. And that's one of the tensions, and we can talk about that too, but that really careful balance of having the information to know what kinds of decisions we need to make, having the relationships to be able to, to make that happen and to continue to get the information, and also shifting a lot of money and resources around. We want to we want to invest in things that are working, invest in things that show promise and reduce money and spending and effort and time in things that aren't. Well, how do you know the difference? Well, that's complex. That's a very complex problem. Excellent. What is your thoughts, my good friend? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, David, for your introduction and, and your take on resilience. 
and uh, we would like definitely our audience would will also like to know what is resilience and especially in your words and then and taking that question to an extent you you have very uh, unique career so far in in multiple areas and heavily involved in portfolio program and project management particularly in IT so how has that shaped your perspective as a whole right well those are simple and straightforward fast questions good <laughs> um, <laughs> what was the first one no. uh, so definition so you know it's interesting I, I it'd be nice to be able to show you the graph here i, I did a google search for uh the words right words resilient resilience um and natural selection Right. So it's very interesting because a lot of our thinking about resilience comes from Darwin's book on natural selection, the origin of the species in the late 1800s. Uh, and if you map those words, you know, they're pretty close until you get to about the year 2000. And resilience goes like this all of a sudden because we're mm -hmm. like, hey, um, boy, life sure is getting crazy. Boy, it's really getting to be a VUCA world, or all volatile and uncertain and complex and all these things. Um, and I think we're we have a, a at least an inkling of an understanding that it's going to be quite a challenge to prepare for the unknowable, uh, prepare for the complex, prepare for things that you can't delineate to prepare for. How do you do that? And you know, part of the answer is. If you're serious about it, you start putting in the competencies around resilience. So back to what is it, right? Um, I think, you know, the easiest way to explain it is the ability and willingness to to embrace change in the face of, of uncertainty. Uh, more so maybe the willingness to acknowledge and embrace loss. Um, one of the things that became clear in all of our stories, all of the narratives, well, most of them, around COVID or around the Christchurch earthquakes or around uh, uh, the Hurricane Katrina or around Fukushima or around any of these big prolonged disasters or problems, uh, the narrative is, wow, there's a lot of loss here. Um, and it might not be, yes, of course, there's loss of, of, of money, there's loss of facilities, there's loss of life, but even losses of, I used to work in the office with people and now I'm home, or I used to have job X and now I have job Y, or we used to produce widgets and now we're a discotheque. I mean, the changes are phenomenal and, and the, the ability to be able to make those changes uh, is what's really part of that resilience. And so in the book, I mean, I continue to call into question, like, you know, everyone's, oh, I want to be resilient. We need, our organization needs to be resilient. Do you know mm -hmm. what that means? Because the costs of that are going to be high. What that means is you're going to have to embrace a lot of loss and a lot of change. It means you're going to have to be willing to shift resources. It means really you're going to have to have people who are iconoclasts, dissenters, um, no sayers, red teamers, and you're going to have to have an environment that supports them. Um, because, you know, look, it's like the what got you here won't get you there. The things that made you successful up to this point, uh, particularly efficiencies, and now we can get into uh, fragile and anti-fragile and robust. Um, most of the things that we have in our organizations are there to keep the status quo. And most of the time that's good because we get efficiencies, we get economies of scale, uh, we get manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. And being able to continue and reinforce the status quo most times works until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, now you've got to have a whole different set of strategies. And they're going to be about loss and change and reality and culture uh, and et cetera. Uh, Mudasir, I'll say this too. Um, I do offer a very technical ac academic definition at the end of the book because mm -hmm. I feel we need that. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, one of the big things is, is, is change and, and evolution. Um, you're not going to be a resilient organization. If nothing happens to you and you don't have to change, you're not resilient. That's just status quo. Mm -hmm. That's just, you know, I mean, you can think about, well, rocks aren't resilient. They, they just sit there. They're strong. They can withstand a lot of things. 
until they can't. And they have no idea that they need to change and they can't change. Right. So now we get back all the way back around to where I started a few minutes ago. If anyone remembers what that was, it's back to sort of the origin of the species. Right. And so now you're back to that. There is a sense of adapting and a sense of flourishing and a sense of change. Something has to change in order for you to be resilient or you wouldn't need to be resilient in the first place. Um, as far as sort of bringing this to other areas, uh, I don't even really know where to begin there. Um, yeah, <laughs> maybe I just stop. Yeah, I mean, I've seen this. How about this? How about this? One of the key things, for example, in portfolio management is the idea that for particularly project portfolio management is, look, all right, you know, some percentage of our projects and pick a number, 70, 80 percent, that has to be, you know, the bread and butter, keep the lights on, keep going. Um, the next percentages are like, hey, you know, we have to do these things. They're mandated. They're not our normal things. But, but then some percent at the top should be, discretionary. Let's try some new things. Let's do some new things. And you know, one of the interesting things about projects is they're all, they're usually new, new stuff. And you typically have a team that comes together that isn't hierarchical. You start to get into what I call in the book, a, a crew. It's not exactly the same because you've got charters and those types of things. But what's interesting about projects is you're bringing a group of people together, very different backgrounds. If you're lucky, very different opinions and perspectives and ideas and beliefs and all these, you want to have that tension in there and all organized around uh, a single uh, a goal. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then they come together, they do the thing and they disband, uh, which is fascinating because that is one of the strange things. I never thought about a crew going into resilience ever, um, you know, teams and committees and things like that. But one of the stories that kept coming up time and time again is we used a crew uh, to get us through. What's that? Well, look, we need to figure out whether um, how, how we're going to get students online, uh, how we're going to have mm -hmm. alcoholic beverages that will let people buy from our doorstep, not, even though it's illegal right now, how we're going to have telehealth even though that's not allowed right now? How are we gonna have our court systems function over Zoom? Uh, and these conversations are not like, well, let's get the two vice presidents and they come and they talk and then the two next, right? It's like, well, you know, if we think about, for example, uh, the, the healthcare for the homeless in Baltimore and how are we going to service our population when we can't let them all come through the door? Well, that's a conversation with doctors and nurses and facilities and HR and security. And I mean, just a, a whole collection of interesting people that have to come together to solve specific problems. Excellent. Excellent. So, so to, I, I want to kind of ask another question, if you will, David. So definitely the, the reference to the barbell strategy, Taleb's barbell strategy is what you're referring to. That's one key thing. I, I would call it out very, very keenly because that is a very, very critical source relative to anti-fragility. I think another key thing, of course, is exactly what you've mentioned around crews. We have Amy Edmonton, if you will. She's talked about teaming as a concept. You know, before I'll say to be very blunt about it, before crews became popular. So, I so a lot of this there's a historical precedent which one can claim organizations haven't done their learnings and haven't put it into practice, and one can be very blunt about that. But but I but I want to ask you a, a key question, my good friend, which I'm sure is lingering on 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 the listeners' minds, because looking at your background in particular from business continuity and organizational results. How do you kind of begin to sort of balance and correlate those two concepts? I'd love to kind of get your thoughts there. Yeah, I imagine a, a lot of folks listening in might not be too interested. So I'll try and keep it brief. And then like, you're like, wait a minute, no, that is interesting. Let's go down that rabbit hole a little bit. I, I really, and so let's bring out Taleb and let's bring in the anti-fragile. And maybe you will, you will definitely say this better than I will, but essentially uh, what he says is, look, um, you've got, entities, functions, and processes which are fragile. Uh, and that's a kind of funny word uh, because a lot of our processes are that. And these are the things that we do over and over and over again. They're very clear that we know how they're going to end up most times. Um, and most of the things we do during the day are going to be in this fragile category. But then we move into the robust. And in, let's say, the world of, of preparedness and continuity, almost everything we do falls right there. So if you think about, let's say cybersecurity, right? What is cybersecurity? Well, let's prevent the bad cyber thing from happening. And then when it does happen, let's get as fast as we can back to the way it was. 
Same with business continuity, right? Um, business continuity is, hey, um, this bad thing has happened to us. Um, we can't work in our normal fashion. We can't, uh, we don't have the normal people or resources or facilities. How do we as quick as possible keep things going and then get back to the way things were and get back and get back and get back. At some point, the change, the uncertainty, the disruption is going to outstrip all of that. And that's what you see uh, with Hurricane Katrina. That's what you see with uh, the Christchurch earthquakes. And that's what you saw with COVID, right? Um, and what's very interesting in the realm of business continuity, I could not have sat down with stakeholders, with participants and said, let's think about how we offer uh, court cases over Zoom. That's not allowed. Let's talk about how we offer alcoholic beverages at our restaurant to go. That's not allowed. That's illegal. Um, none of these were, you couldn't talk about them. We couldn't plan for them. We couldn't do that. And yet that's where we went. Why? Because at some point the change is going to outstrip both the fragile and the robust. And now we're into the anti-fragile. And the organizations that are going to be in the best shape to take advantage of that are the, those that have the capabilities that are anti-fragile. Um, but back to maybe, I think, one of your very opening points, Cy, uh, that comes at a cost, right? We're not just, you know, it's a pretty easy sell to go to your board and say, hey, um, we need to invest more in cybersecurity. Well, of course you do. That's very, very, very smart. Yes, we should do that. Um, we need to invest in... Uh, in active listening skills for our managers. Wait, what? Soft skills? You got to be kidding me. But it turns out that, for example, and it was quite clear. Now, this is another point you made, Cy, which is, hey, do, didn't we learn? Couldn't we have learned some of these lessons before? And the answer is absolutely. One of the things that came out from the Christchurch earthquakes is that any time, not any time, but following a disaster, particularly a prolonged disaster, at any particular point, somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of people are seriously considering leaving. Well, Hmm. Does that number sound familiar to anyone in the last, you know, year with the, the great resignation right around 40 to 50 percent? Hmm. What's the key indicator here? What's the key factor? Empowerment. Now, go back and watch the uh, the deconstructed episode with Mark Cole, because Mark Cole talks a lot about the real power structures that are there. And that's very interesting. He talks about Foucault and some of the other bits there that we need to keep in mind. But real empowerment, care. That's the one of the biggest things. And if we look at something like, why are the uh, uh, um, uh, Starbucks employees trying to unionize? It's not about money. It's not about work hours. It was about is they didn't listen to us. They didn't take us seriously. They didn't value our lives on the front lines. And so now we really get into these, uh, these ideas about, oh, what's it going to cost to be resilient? Well, you're going to have to care about your employees. You're going to have to listen to them. You're going to have to empower them in real empowerment. You're going to have to allow for dissent. You're going to have to allow for entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial and red teams. And all of that has a cost. And you know what? We get real into the touchy feely stuff, but the touchy feely stuff is absolutely dollars and cents, bottom line financial impact. Well said, Murisu. Did you have a thought, my good friend, or or? Yeah, uh, chime in. I can continue the conversation. I don't want to interrupt. Go ahead. So, so David, I'm, I'm sure one of the things that you know, especially folks that have read your book and likewise are are listening, and you've mentioned capital. As you said, you, you have the 14, if you will, items, and you organize them into four themes around crews, capital, culture of experimentation, and exponential leadership. As and, and you've really you know dived into capital uh, in this conversation. You know, as a lot of people look at those, they say, well, you know really none of these are new. So it's great to organize them. They're the champ. So one question that comes to mind, especially as you've done your research and what have you is why have we missed these yeah. elements over the years or, or what's missing for lack of better words, David, as you did the research, Boy. I'm sure you've got some epiphanies that came up. I'll tell you, I would think the number one reason for all of this and why it's all going to be so difficult and so challenging is it challenges the status quo. Everything that you're going to need to be to be resilient 
is going to challenge the status quo and not across the whole organization. Look, we don't want every single employee to be uh, dissidents and iconoclists and to, to, to be devil's advocates. You can't have an organization that runs that way, right? We've got to have efficiencies. We, the status quo is there for a reason. But when you start talking about, for example, um, it could turn out that in the new situation, my entire department is not as important as it used to be. In fact, it would be great if we took the money that my department has and moved it over to a different department and invested in that. Am I mm -hmm. going to suggest that? You know, am I going to say, hey, you know what, why don't you just dissolve my department and all my employees? Uh, and because it would really be better over there. Um, it's the person who's going to say, you know what, um, boss, I don't think this is the right place that we should be operating. I don't think this is the right product we should be doing. I don't think our teams are happy. I don't think morale is good. I don't think all of these are very challenging things. Um, and you have all sorts of cognitive biases, of course, uh, that want to reinforce what exists, to want to keep things as they are, to go against change. Um, and, you know, again, as Mark Cole and others have talked about, um, and what I find very interesting is, is so many of the people that you've had on have talked about, they haven't talked about money. They haven't talked about responsibility. They haven't talked about, you know what they talk about? Safety, psychological safety and sociological safety. Isn't that weird that in 2022, our main concerns in the workplace are, are psychological safety? That's very telling, I think. And so I think we have this, you know, how... How does uh, how does an organization function? And it, you know it functions by, with power dynamics from the top down. And um, when you are going to have to change, and there's going to be loss, who's going to volunteer for loss? Nobody. Uh, very few people. So it's a very challenging situation, and you really are talking about. Sometimes organizations have had to pivot very dramatically in order to be able to not just survive, but survive, but also to come and try and flourish in a new environment of new stakeholders, new stockholders, new shareholders, new rules, new regulations, disruptive uh, 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 technologies. And, you know, a lot of these we do to ourselves. We have mergers, we have acquisitions, we have uh, implementing new technologies that change all the way that we all do business. And I think that's what's very interesting is, you know, there's going to be this big tension of, I don't really want to be a resilient organization when you lay it out like this. This is hard. This is challenging. This means, you know, I really got to toughen up uh, in my leadership to be able to, to hear some of these things and be like, allowed. You know, I go back to the book, um, you know, an example would be like uh, Lincoln's uh, cabinet, the team of rivals, right? Uh, so, I mean, Lincoln basically staffs his cabinet with all these people that are very opposed to most of his policies. Uh, and it's a very uncomfortable way to work. Uh, you don't have fun going into the office like that when everyone's, you know, you don't have a lot of people agreeing with your core values. And yet, you know, arguably he was a very successful president. Um, same types of things, right? We need to, to, to come together with teams uh, that are different perspectives. And, you know, one of the, the things in the research, I think this comes from Snowden's dream teams, but I could be wrong about this. But anyway, but I, I think that's it. You know, one of the ex experiments was if you have a, a team, uh, and I will use the word team, but it could be a crew, and you have at least one person that poses different opinions or a different suggestion about how to go or just opposition to, to the general thing movement of things it will be uncomfortable it will be less enjoyable you will not share the same spree de corps as it were and you will likely be about 66 percent more successful and more accurate and come to solutions that are better and you'll come to them faster it's very uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, and I think we've learned, I think we have a lot of anecdotes. Again, when I thought about resilience, I went back to, oh, resilience is a collection of business continuity and cybersecurity and insurance and risk management. And I think that's what we think resilience is. But when we really bring into this significant loss and change and unpredictability, uh, then I think we've got something else. And that's a tough, that's tough. It's tough. Why would I want to do that? That's hard. Don't make me do that until I have to do it. 
-hmm. Organizations, people have a lot of difficulty dealing with death. And that, that's very, very true, if you will. Muris, I thought my good friend or a question for David. Yeah, so based on what you walk us through, David, I'm thinking, uh, in, but innovation to challenging the status is, is resilience or how is that different? Right. Well, just challenging the status quo, you know, that, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily get us anything one way or the other, right? It's got to yes. be in, in purpose of getting us ready to be able to change, uh, getting us, having the capabilities in place so that when all of a sudden we have outstripped our normal day-to-day clear, complicated, right? So now we can bring in the Kinefin framework uh, where we have, we have clear, we have complicated. But once we get into these situations, and what I'm going to argue is we're going to get into them more often and at a faster pace. And I think we can argue that, you know, look, look at the, look at the most success, the successful companies this decade. What do you want to bet they're around the next decade? Um, you know, and as we look back in time, you know, we have our Sears, we have our, uh, our Kmart, we have all these, these big companies that, you know, the Nokia's and the, all the, these big, huge, successful companies, and they don't all survive from one decade to the next. And I think that's going to get shorter. Um, so uh, part of that is we need to know, uh, we need to have these capabilities in place so that we can say, okay, um, how about something easy like, oh, I know we're going through a tough time right now. I should probably listen a little more carefully to my employees. I should probably check in with them a little more often. I should have this idea, oh, there's a thing called a crew. Uh, you know, we could put a crew together to come up with some solutions. We could, so a simple example, right? Um, in the project management portfolio, uh, a PMO office, uh, one of the things you do is you move projects through phase gates, which is you say, hey, okay, we know a little bit about what wants to be done. Should we investigate it and really come up with an estimate? Okay, good. And now we've come up with the estimate. It was a, we thought it was going to be $5,000. Now it's $50,000. Do you still want to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And you move it all down the pipe, but you have these stop gaps in the middle to make sure, is this still what we want to do? Does this still make sense as the world has changed? Well, one of the things that's good to do at each one of those steps is appoint somebody to be the devil's advocate, which is to say at every one of those points, somebody needs to stand up and say falsely or rightly, no, we shouldn't do this. And let me give you some reasons why. But just the idea of red teaming, right? Just the idea, look, we should have somebody uh, that sits here. One organization had some, I think they put a giant stuffed animal uh, here, and that represented the voice of the customer. Now, let's think about what is the customer going to do here? What, what is a devil's advocate? What, right? So look, there's lots, of, there's lots of little things we can do that are inexpensive, that are little experiments that could help us quite a lot in changing our thinking around these types of things. So on the one hand, I think, you know, it is a costly endeavor to really be a resilient organization. It has to be. On the other hand, we can start rather slowly. Uh, and just the some of these ideas like, hmm, maybe it's not always good to tighten the belt and not spend anything. Maybe it's not always a good idea uh, to make all decisions at the top uh, with just a few people weighing in that have the same values, et cetera, et cetera. Excellent. Another question, Mauricio, or should I jump in with a question, my good friend? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Excellent. So, David, David I, I, love, I love the broad stroke, if you will, around, on the canvas in, in many ways. And this is exactly why I started with the quote when we launched, if you will, an endless embrace of change, yeah. the will to evolve and, and hopefully flourish. Yeah. But, but kind of, you know, our listeners definitely are very, very interested in fundamentally, what have you learned from helping put these concepts and aspects into practice? So very, very implementation what has surprised you perhaps from practice david that's a good question and i'll give you the honest answer which is it's too soon to know i haven't had a lot of i mean the book just came out in july the you know the the the, the research is still new so i haven't had a lot of opportunity um to implement it the surprises for me of course were um just really none of the things that i talk about other than maybe capital uh, and maybe some of the cultural pieces were what I would have assumed about resilience going in. 
uh, all of this was was surprising to me. Uh, I'd never I'd never thought about a crew. Um, I'd never thought about um, you know some of the strong tie and weak tie networks and et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, I think the biggest challenge is, I mean, to say it again and to go back. So this is what's interesting too about your podcast, right? So, you know, you have the, the, the D constructed and in the middle you have your X and the X is the chi and that gets to the crossing and the chiasm. And, you know, what I see in this podcast and in your interviews is we're starting to. David, we lost, we lost you, my good friend. We're losing you. Okay. I'm back now. Was, Actually, no, back. I, we don't, don't want to lose any of what you're saying. I gesticulated <laughs> into the mute button. Very good. But at least I made Mudasir smile, and that's good. Um, <laughs> Great. The devil. What devil was I talking about? Oh, um, implementation, right? It, oh, oh, and I was talking about the X. Some of the kind of these stories, right? Yeah. What kinds of stories we're hearing? We're hearing so many about the human, right? Um, that financially successful organizations simply can't ignore the human. And because Mudasir is, is asked a similar question, so project management for the longest time struggled with this as well. So think about where project management comes from. It comes from aerospace, right? It comes from NASA. It comes from engineers. The first iterations of the, the project management body of knowledge are inputs and outputs, and it's very uh, crisp, and it's very detailed, and you have, you know, here's what comes in, here's what goes out. And what came to the fore after a few decades are like, that's great, but you don't do these things without people. And the people have to buy in. They have to try. <laughs> they have to yeah. trust. They have to accept your product at the end. And so, you know, it was very interesting. And of course, that leads into Agile and some other pieces. But a real struggle in project management body of knowledge to try and express, well, you don't really have a lot of inputs and outputs for human beings that really make a lot of sense at the end of the day. Uh, we can all be scenarian rats in boxes, but not really. Um, and, and so you, the, the stories that you that you guys are all bringing together are stories of, you know, what are the human values and, and, and what does it mean to, you know, have value, autonomy, mastery, and purpose? Um, but I think what's important is that the organizations that ignore the human element uh, are not going to be as successful as those that, that don't. Gotcha. So, uh, so, so David, uh, even pre, cause you've had a long career, if you will, in continuity, et cetera, exactly as you've described. And even though the book exactly, as you said, came out recently, I mean, kind of going further, if you will, than the book, kind of all these sort of culmination of experiences and what have you, you know, sort of, uh, lessons from practice that our listeners can say, you know something, maybe there's one thing I can do differently. So very practically, what not only has surprised you, what is one practical, uh, uh, you know, sort of directive you can offer our listeners? My goodness. Oh, there's so, I mean, there's so many, right? So here, just, I mean, off the top of my head, right? We talked about this earlier. Find, find someone to, to be somewhat contrarian in your teams, in your groups. Uh, you know, if, if you're going down this path and everyone's yes, 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 yes. Uh, maybe one person should go, well, Really? Maybe no. Let's just throw it out there. I'm not saying that. I'm not going against anyone. Let's just, you know, think of it. I mean, but really so much of it comes down to, A, can we think differently? Uh, and we haven't talked a lot about the culture uh, and the culture of experimentation. Uh, but what becomes quite clear, particularly when you start bringing in both the anti-fragile uh, and the, uh, the Kinefin framework, is when we are in these situations that are very complex, that are unknown, they're unpredictable, not only can we not just sit in a room, a few of us, and have a discussion and come to a solution, we usually don't even know what the problem is at that point. So let's think about back to the starts of COVID, right? Um, Will customers come to the restaurant or won't they? Uh, will people show up to telehealth appointments or won't they? Uh, will How comfortable will people be with, can, can we change the legislature? Can we do this? Can we offer here? Can people work from home? The, there were so many questions and we didn't even know sort of how do they get to the problems. Well, how do you answer those? Well, you do little experiments. You do little, thoughtful, iterative, parallel experiments to try and figure out. You know, uh, somebody back in the 90s when we were talking, it wasn't agile at that time. It was extreme, extreme with a big X, uh, project management. It was very simple. You know, it's, how do you sum that up? Well, if it's working, do more of it. 
If it's not working, do less of it. If you don't know if it's working or not working, do little experiments. Um, so there's lots of things that everyone can do uh, to try and think differently, try and get over cognitive biases, to try and care more, to listen more, uh, to empower more, to be more comfortable with ambiguity and change. Now, that all sounds nice and rosy, um, but I am very keen to the realities that Mark Cole and others on your show have brought up, which is that's not as easy to do from the bottom up as it is from the top down. Um, and he had that very great example of he's like, look, I'm a middle aged white guy who's been with this this uh, organization a while. And I can say things that are uh, iconoclast, dissension, oppositional, red teaming. And they're like, oh, that's just Mark. That's OK. Yeah, he's just like that. Whereas, you know, a young black man, they might be that's insubordination and you are now fired. So, you know, we have to recognize some of these things as well. And the status quo will typically protect itself, as we all will. I don't want to give up my team and my money. And, uh, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time maybe building an empire here or at least just trying to get through my day. And the, the way that I do that is I've got some money and I've got some people and I've got some, you know, territory and these types of things. And to be able to bring in a team that, you know, part of their job is to question that everything I'm doing to some degree, um, come up with different ideas, come up with better ways of working, come up with challenging scenarios, come up, you know, all of these types of things. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy. So I think there's plenty for everyone to do, but I think there's a very, there better be a re very realistic understanding uh, that most of those things are going to be a lot more effective and maybe even possible coming from the top. We can all be leaders. We can all care. We can all do our best where we are, obviously. Uh, but the power structure, the status quo, the culture, all of these things are much easier coming from the top down uh, than from the bottom up. Interesting. Mudis here, my good friend, a thought? Damn, he's, just, uh... he's like, it's all nonsense. That's garbage. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is the worst interview we've had so far. Nah, he's got it out most of this. Not, not at all. Not at all. Do chime in, Mudis here. <clears throat> so, David, you brought up anti-fragility as well as kind of a framework uh, uh, comparison. So maybe, uh, Sai, I don't know how we are doing on time, but how is it related yet not related? Any thoughts there? Related to, to uh, resilience? Yes. It's entirely, I think, it related. I think one of the things that was a real eye-opener was, uh, first of all, that you do... One of the things that, that Kenefin really brings out is behaviors that work in one situation, in one kind of environment, not only won't work, but will be counterproductive in other environments. So in a situation like COVID, like Hurricane Katrina, like the Christchurch earthquakes, like uh, the things that we're seeing in Haiti and Puerto Rico right now, all of these problems, um, the, the kinds of actions that we take when things are clear, when things are merely complicated, those work in some respect, those work well in those decisions. But once we've outstripped the normal, once we can't turn on the lights and we don't have the people and we can't fall back into what we were doing and we, these things are gone and, and things are bad and hard and challenging and it goes on for a long time, we've got to try something different. Because if we just keep doing the things that we've been doing, it's going to make things so much worse. And again, it's the what you got you here won't get you there. Um, the, the world has changed probably right from underneath your feet. Right? You can't come into the office anymore. You can't right. have people at your restaurant anymore. You can't have people walking into your care facility anymore. What are we going to do? So, and and then the people, I was somewhat obvious. You keep doing the same things as you've always done. Well, it's not going to work. It's going to make things worse. So. At that point, right? So this is the, this is what Kenefin says is you've got to act very differently. And, and how do you deal with the complicated? Sorry, the complex. How do you deal with the complex? Well, mm -hmm. it's a probe, sense, respond. It's well, let's figure out just what's going on here. And how do we do that? Well, we make little probes. We make little experiments. We try and figure out, you know, mm -hmm. if I offer uh, something at the restaurant, will people come in or not? If I offer a special, will they do this? If I offer a phone, whatever, right? These little thoughtful experiments to try and learn what the heck is going on and what's going to work. 
eventually we need to get back to the complicated and the clear, right? Operating in the, in the, in the complex and the chaotic is going to wear us out. Um, although, of course, the caveat to that is I think we're going to be operating in the, in the complex and the chaotic much more often uh, than, than we're used to. Uh, but yeah, those are very clear. And then, you know, the, the, the fragile, anti-fragile. For me, honestly, the, the strange thing is that middle category of the robust, because that is where I always thought that resilience would be, right? You could buy mm -hmm. uh, risk management and cybersecurity and you have enough of those things. And oh, well, then you've built in the buffers. You're going to be OK. You'll get back or you'll go to a new normal. Well, no. All of those know how to get back to something known. None of them know how to get onto something that's new. Very well said. Very well said. Thank you. Sai, do you have any closing thoughts? Well, maybe we'll start off with David's closing thought. I don't have, I don't have any more questions, but should we? <laughs> I feel we've had a, a dramatic lack of philosophy. Like all your other people are talking about Heidegger, Derrida, Foucault, uh, Lacan. Uh, and I think these are important. Uh, so let's have at least one out here. So, uh, you know, in, and I'll go back to the quote. I'll sort of try and wrap it all the way yeah. back to the beginning. So we talk about, uh, you know, that, that never ending acceptance of loss, like how on earth do you do that? That's not easy. And the other folks have talked about that, right? Uh, uh, um, Kristen Ulmer, for example, is like embracing those types of things. But so to get the philosophy, so Nietzsche talks about uh, the, the uh, amor fati, the love of mm -hmm. fate uh, and the eternal recurrence of the same. Um, one of his thought experiments is imagine that you had to relive your life exactly as it was forever. It would repeat exactly again and again and again and again forever. And the only way that you can sort of overcome that situation, which might be otherwise terrifying, horrifying and depressing and de debilitating is to embrace it. And that love of, of change, that love of, uh, of, of the unknown, that amour fati, and to do it day after day after day uh, and to be able to embrace that change. Uh, I think that's incredibly hard. <laughs> I think it's hard for human beings. I think it's devilishly hard for organizations. Um, but, you know, I think that's what we're moving into. Your other folks talk about existentialism and we need to talk at some point about postmodernism. Because as we're now moving into an age uh, where we don't uh, agree on sort of the ethical principles uh, and even rational principles and even things that I can look at and say whether it's yes or no, we get into what's the most sort of important position on YouTube? Well, it's an influencer. And how do we influence thought and belief and those types of things? Um, and organizations are going to have a tricky time as we continue to move into an increasingly VUCA world. Well said. Any close? Thank you, David. Any closing thoughts, Mauricio, from your perspective before I offer just a, sort of a perspective likewise? So uh, based on what David shared, and then uh, I tried to follow as much as possible. But, but one thing I picked up is endless embrace of change. And that is where the business continuity resilience will be tested and we will get evolved. Yeah, and that's yeah. not easy, right? That is not easy. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. one of the words that I've, just, and honestly, it's because I was listening to your show. One of the words that I, I, is starting to come back to now is sort of, is wisdom. And that's a frightening word in some respects. But if you think about, look, I can't have just the status quo, but I can't have chaos. I can't have, you know, I've got to have a, an efficient organization, but not overly efficient. I need to have it fragile, but also anti-fragile. There are all these tensions. How do you balance all of these tensions? When do you know whether uh, I need an iconoclist on my team or not? How, how do I know when I pivot? How do I know when I change direction? How do I know all of these decisions? Uh, part of that comes from information and relationships and experimentation, but part of it, those decisions are going to come from judgment, and that judgment is going to be a matter of wisdom. Oh boy, that's going to open up a big can of worms there. Uh, and so many of these things that we don't talk very much about in, in the C-suites of organizations, the soft skills, empathy, active listening, caring, and wisdom. Oh, heavens to Murgatroyd. Well said again. Any, any, any final closing thoughts I want to see before I offer sort of a, a, a thought or two? Uh, go, go ahead, Sai. 
Excellent. Yeah, we you went full it. circle. We got back to the. I quotes, tried. Right? I tried quotes. to bring us back. Yeah. But that. But that's exactly why we started there, my good man. That's precisely why we started there because that quote does capture, quite honestly, so much. I mean, that that's that's very very key. The endless embrace of change, and the will to evolve and, and hopefully flourish. Um, I, very very key. And I know I know our conversation here could go on for a very long time, uh, especially in the areas that you know we've we've touched upon. Let's put it that way. Uh, and exactly to your point, really, fragility is part of anti-fragility. If you don't have the fragile, then you can't be anti-fragile. That's very, very uh, key. But one of the one of the key things I think, um, and Munister, I think you, you heavily agree. And likewise, David, you've listened to a number of the um, the conversations that we've had, the the practical aspects that come into play, and all the facets, right? And kind of what people can do with this this these conversations is is very wide and and and. and you know, impactful, if you will. So definitely, I, lo I love the reference to the the whole idea of, of fate, right, and embracing our fate. And one of the key things, especially as you know about me and the, our relationship with death and, death and embracing death. Especially you, Sai, especially there, there you. you. Go. Yeah, there you yeah. go. And, and it's interesting because I the new normal, there is no normal. There's never been a normal. Yes. Um, you know, and no, I but, know I... I'm but sorry. the pace of not normal is changing, is becoming more rapid, is, I think. The awareness to it. I wouldn't even say the pace, quite honestly. It's the awareness of it. And I know in 2020, when COVID hit, you know, people talk about the new normal. I said, look, folks, there is no new normal. It's actually the trans normal because the, and, and to your point, the pace is is a factor, but the awareness is definitively, a, and that goes to wisdom. It definitely goes to wisdom. Um, you know, I'm hoping we'll have more conversations uh, specifically around the practical pieces because I know for us, if you will, um, and I'll, I'll reference two colleagues in particular, and I'm not sure if you've seen their work. Likewise, as, as, as my work is very tied to theirs, um, Brad Barton and Mark Ferraro, we actually published a book in 2013 around a lot of these concepts, around anti-fragility, around these other concepts. Uh, and then in 2016, my book came out. But the practical stuff dates back 40 plus years. So I'm, I'm hopeful, my good friend, David, you will return for more conversations around some of the practical aspects and, and doing what we do. Yeah. And I think Excellent. that's, you know, one of the things that now we're back to that balance and now we're back to that wisdom, which is, you know, the, the challenge in front of us is rather daunting, but there are even very little things that we can do that give us an advantage, that give us a chance, that give us some additional options that we would not have had otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. So definitively, another good conversation with David Lindstedt, by all means. And my good man, is, as you said, that quote captured so much in the beginning. So we did all we had to do to welcome you into it. So thank you for making the time, David. I truly of course. look forward to the next conversation. Absolutely. Me too. Me as well. Thank Great you so much. You, Thanks, Sai. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you both thank so much. You. Take good care now. And Bye, thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much. Bye.